Welcome back, everybody. In today's lecture, we're going to be looking at the topic of problem solving, essentially an extension of what we've been looking at with intelligence and some of the other cognitive topics that we've been looking at throughout the course of this last few classes. And my hope is that when we cover this idea of problem solving, much like some of the ones we've discussed earlier, you won't only find some intuitive value in a lot of what we're looking at, but find lots of applications in the numerous things that we'll be exploring in this meeting. To start off, what I'd like to do is give you a problem. I want you to think about how you might actually solve it, and if you've actually got a way to solve it, by all means, feel free to try to tackle this problem on your own. So let's start by just introducing the problem. At the beginning of a summer camp, the number of boys was five times the number of girls. After 144 boys left the camp, there were twice as many girls as boys. What was the total number of children at the beginning of camp? Uh, my guess is that your mind is thinking about what type of problem this is. Some of you might have immediately thought of the fact that this is probably a math problem and you need to access your memory of math topics. But if you were to say just encounter this problem, where you are trying to encounter this problem, what are your options in terms of how you can tackle it? This is what problem research, problem solving research is all about. And when you look at a problem like this, essentially you're faced with one of two options. You can utilize what's called an algorithm to solve this problem, where you find some step-by-step -step way of tackling it, or you can utilize something that we're going to be talking about very shortly called a heuristic, a kind of a rule of thumb shorthand way of trying to get at an answer. Now, we're going to talk about the pluses and minuses of these as we progress, but I also want to note here that this particular problem is just one type of problem that people researching these ideas look at. Other problems are more what we call open-ended. There's potential outcomes that go in a bunch of different ways, and when we look at how people solve those problems, the ideas of algorithms and heuristics are still a component to them. But there's another split that we want to identify here before we progress, and it's the difference between what we call maximizing and satisficing. Our maximizing is our attempt to essentially dig through something so we can get the best outcome possible. And satisficing is when we try to just figure out a solution that will work to a problem. As I mentioned, the first example maybe doesn't necessarily fit into the category of am I going to maximize or satisfice. It more is focused on algorithms and heuristics, but just so we understand that problem solving researchers don't just look at narrow problems like the one we looked at, I wanted to mention that before we progress. So what are algorithms again? Well, if we're looking at that first question and you come to the conclusion that what you really need to do is just do the math, calculate it out, well, then what you're using are these very specific, rudimentary, set, mechanical attempts to understand something by just following a step-by-step -step process. You know, machines theoretically use all these algorithms when trying to solve problems, and there's always these step-by-step -step answers that get us always, in the correct, when used correctly, I guess, to an accurate response. But if there's open-ended kind of questions that we don't necessarily know what the best way to tackle them are, algorithms can be problematic because if you have an algorithm that's not getting at the correct answer, uh, it can be time-consuming and not get you to where you need to be. Moreover, some algorithms and certain problems can just be time-consuming on their own simply because they require us to fall a number of steps that might be superfluous in certain problems that we encounter. Heuristics, on the other hand, can get us to an answer very quickly when we encounter a problem because they allow us to skip things that maybe we don't need to use. They're usually, if we're talking about when we use heuristics, based on some type of experience or some type of strategy that we've learned to develop in other similar situations. It's very challenging to come up with random heuristics to problems that we've never encountered, 
but if we have something that we can relate a problem to, well then relying on heuristics could potentially be an option. But it's really critical to note here that when we engage in these heuristics, we sometimes will not arrive at a correct response. And algorithms almost always get us to a correct response unless we're not using the right algorithm. Heuristics, even when used appropriately, sometimes can miss things and bring us to incorrect responses, even if we get to those incorrect responses very quickly. And that's the big plus of these heuristics. If you're facing a mountain of problems and it's really tough to solve them, you could potentially use a heuristic to, to get to answers in a much faster amount of time. And this brings me to a really important idea that we referenced earlier, and that's how heuristics can be used for a variety of different purposes. If we are trying to solve some type of a problem that's more open-ended, that requires us to really get the most out of the solution we come up with, we might engage in a heuristic that we call maximizing. Um, to maximize, what we first need to do is consider all of the different options in front of us with the problem that we're presented. To come up with all of these different options and consider their potential utility, this particular approach or heuristic approach to solving these open-ended problems is oftentimes very time-consuming. But if done correctly, what it affords us the opportunity to do is come up with a solution to a problem that will more often than not be much happier with than if we, say, just randomly came up with some type of solution to these open-ended problems. Of course, it doesn't necessarily mean that in every situation, maximizing is our best option. Sometimes, because we're pressed for need, or maybe we're pressed for time, sorry, or maybe we don't need to necessarily come up with the best option for a problem, we might engage in another type of heuristic that we call satisficing. You know, satisficing theoretically gets us to some type of solution, but it does not entail us considering all the different paths that we could potentially take and then choosing one after we've considered the different outcomes that we think is going to get us to that best outcome that could potentially occur. Now, this could potentially result in people feeling some type of remorse or regret if they've done something where they've satisficed on in a very important topic in their life. But oftentimes, when we look at people trying to solve problems that utilize satisficing, we tend to see it happening more in situations where there isn't much time to come up with an answer or we just don't care about something nearly as much. The regrets and other things tend to come when, say, we're really forced because we haven't acted on something soon enough uh, to satisfy. So maybe some of you might have encountered this with papers that you've had issues with or approaches to kind of how to choose classes or, I don't know, do, do something in a specific activity. Right? Time is a big component. Value is a big component. If we are forced to do it, you know, satisficing theoretically is a heuristic that will get us to an answer, even if it's not the best. And this brings me to other things that could kind of become problematic when we start using heuristics. More often than not, when people study heuristics in the 1970s, 80s, and beyond, what they focused in on were some of the tricks we used to come up with a shorthand answer that usually got us to a response, even if our response wasn't 100% accurate. One of the first very commonly studied errors that people looked at was something called the representative heuristic, which focused on our kind of idea of which things belonged in groups and which things were most likely based on, as the name sort of implies, how representative something was. Uh, the, the classic example that oftentimes is cited is if I'm given a few hints about something, you know, what thing that could be is usually, I guess, based on what comes to mind most easily, not necessarily what's most common in the world. Like if I said I ran into an animal with big gray ears and a thin tail, because elephants come to mind much more easily 
we don't think of the fact that there's way fewer elephants in the world than there are mice and rats, which also tend to be gray with big gray ears and a thin tail. Uh, this is something that we see very often when we encounter problems. If something does come to mind easily, well, we sometimes overestimate how common something is. Uh, let's say, for example, you get information about some disease that's three times higher among people in a specific area versus another area uh, in terms of the percentage of people within that area that have been diagnosed. Not necessarily the overall number of people that have been diagnosed, but the percentage of people that within that area that have been diagnosed. And then I tell you that somebody was just diagnosed with that disease, and I want you to guess which per town that person is from. Most of us, just based on that information, would probably come to the immediate conclusion that obviously this person is probably from town A, since it's diagnosed so much more in town A from town B. So you would probably say something like, well, since it's three times more common in town A than town B, you probably would guess that Jamie is three times more likely to come from that town A. So where's the problem with this? Where's the problem with saying, you know, there's 75% chance or 66% chance that Jamie's from town A? Well, what you've been provided with in this question is kind of an imperfect amount of information. There's major things missing, and in particular, the base rates of how many people live in town A and town B. We don't know if there's an equal number of people living in town A and town B, and until we know that, we can't come to the answer that you, many of you came to when reading that information. It's sort of an imperfect question. And this is oftentimes what we encounter when we think about answers to the likelihood of things where we don't know about population densities or, or base rates of, and of elements to the question that we're encountering. So we just overlook them and take what we're using. And in doing so, we sometimes come to erroneous decisions or conclusions about the problems that we encounter. If we're looking at how we can parse this representative characteristic out a little bit more, what we tend to say is that, that we, we usually use the representative heuristic when we're talking about commonality or when we're talking about specific cases or, or problems where we're trying to guess the likelihood of something occurring. Uh, it's not necessarily that using things that come to mind is a bad thing, mind you. It's just simply that it can sometimes when trying to solve open-ended problems, especially ones where we're not given all the information, lead us to very faulty conclusions simply because we're not equipped to answer the question correctly without all of that base rate information. Another very common uh, heuristic that people engage in, which again, usually can serve us well, but can be problematic, is something called the availability heuristic. And to understand how this works, I thought we'd do a little activity. Now, this one does require you to sort of sit down and really listen to everything that I'm going to be saying. Uh, note, though, not like the, unlike the memory stuff, you're not going to have to write down everything that I'm reading off to you. Um, so just please sit down, listen, pay attention to a list of names that I'm going to read to you, and then I'm going to ask you a question after I'm done reading this list. So here we go. Walter Coletti, Hillary Clinton, Conrad Stapleton, John Boswell, Billie Jean King, Michael O'Hara, Mariah Carey, Margaret Atwood, Benjamin Harrison, Julia Roberts, Charles Preston, Gabriella Sabatini, Sandra Day O'Connor, Saddam Hussein, Roddy McDowell, Robert Redford, Nancy Reagan, Mickey Owen, Eleanor Roosevelt, Doris Stoddard, Daniel Defoe, Catherine Hepburn, Emily Dickinson, John Foster Dulles, Joe Namath, Howard Cantor, Harriet Ricardo, Christopher Biederman, Anne Blythe, Gracie O'Malley, Zachary Scott, William Shakespeare, 
Martha Stewart, Louis Masterson, Marilyn Monroe, Max Baer, Meryl Streep, Amelia Earhart, Albert Larkin, Alan Little. I just read you a list of names. What I'd like you to do is not try to write down all the names that you've heard. What I want you to try to guess, which was more common, female names or male names? Talk now, this might seem like kind of an odd task, but my guess is right now you're thinking about all the names that you heard. Which one seem to be most common? Which grouping seem to be most common from that? Nods are good if you're like almost everybody else who did this task. The names that came to mind were the ones that you were familiar with. And embedded within those lists were some pretty common names that almost everybody knows. And some other more disparate ones where, unless you're attached to the areas of interest that those people are a part of, maybe you've never heard of before. And unless you've had kind of an atypical life, I'm also guessing that you probably noticed and recognized a lot more female names than male names. And that might have led you to think that there were actually way more females listed than males. But in reality, there was an equal number of females and males listed in that long list of names that I just read to you. Now, how does this, again, relate to the availability here, Stick? What we're doing when we engage in the availability heuristic is thinking about well, what's the most available to us to guess the likelihood of something actually occurring. I love that example that we engage in because it can really highlight how even with data right in front of us, we sometimes still think that, that maybe our perception of what was most common is more correct than what's actually there. You know, another question that people often ask when talking about availability heuristic is, you know, the likelihood of, say, somebody getting attacked by a shark when they go swimming in the ocean. You know, most of us can usually think of specific examples, tragic cases of people getting attacked by sharks that make the news, and it leads us to think that the chances of somebody being attacked by a shark are actually pretty high. And that's because, well, we don't have much information at our disposal other than these vivid experiences that we've encountered when watching the news and heard other stories about these, these traumatic events. So we tend to overestimate how often, unfortunately, uh, people get attacked by sharks because of this availability heuristic. And this often occurs for kind of rare instances that make the news or everybody talks about. You know, people estimating their chances of being robbed at gunpoint at any given point in time usually are overestimated. Uh, but you know, it doesn't mean that that doesn't happen. It's just our calculations of the odds, unless we know base rate information, base statistics, tend to kind of overguess, overestimate how likely certain rare things actually are. Now, to explore some of the other errors we make, I thought we'd at least explain one of the activities that's typically done in this problem-solving class when people are together and sitting in a room. It's kind of impossible to examine this one without being in person because it requires sort of a back and forth between me, the instructor, and you, the student. But we can at least get the gist of it by showing a handout that's often administered to students in class. So what they're done, what's done in this is, is students are given this sequence of three numbers, two, four, six, told that that sequence of numbers fits some kind of random rule that I, as a person coming up with this puzzle, have devised. And it's your job as a person participating in this activity to guess what the rule is based on that information. And most people, when they look at this, come up with some type of guess and then they're asked how sure they are as to whether or not this rule that they came up with is the exact rule that I'm using. 
Afterwards, people are then asked to come up with their own sequence of numbers to test whether or not their rule they've come up with works. And they usually come up with a sequence of three, four numbers, and I am then asked to assess whether or not this idea they've come up with does fit the rule or not. This is where we start to deviate from being able to do this in class. I would then give an assessment of whether or not this, this new series they came up with fits the rule. They'd ask, they'd ask students to then guess what my rule is based on this and then guess again how sure they are that the rule or the guess of my rule they came up with was correct. And we'd do this for three, four, five, maybe even more trials until people got to a point where they thought they were 100% sure of what my exact rule was. How could this lead to erroneous thinking, you might ask? Well, typically what we do when we're doing this activity is we guess very specific rules. So for this activity, the rule that was devised was essentially that the numbers increase in each sequential number that's presented. They don't increase by a specific amount or a specific ratio, they're just continually increasing. But if students in this class performed like many students in other classes, what would often happen is people would start to engage in what we sometimes call functional fixedness and thinking that doesn't entice them to try to prove something by using counterexamples. So oftentimes if I write two, four, six, people come up with this idea that it looks like we're going up by twos. So the next guess that people often give often kind of aligns with this original guess. So they'll write something like six, eight, ten, or yeah, I don't know, um, nine, eleven, uh, thirteen. I whatever it is, what they write it is oftentimes kind of attempts to show something is true by replicating stuff and getting verification that they did seem to be right. Uh, and this tends to go on for five, six trials until people often get to a point where they've convinced themselves that the rule they came up with originally was correct and they are 100% sure that that's the rule I'm using. Now there are other iterations to this. There's other people who sometimes look for counting up by multiples or looking for even numbers. It goes in a bunch of different directions. Uh, what's really interesting with this particular approach is that all these individuals and, and lots of these tasks tend to focus first on trying to prove a rule is true by just looking for supporting evidence. Usually even the best problem solvers that are thinking out of the box wait for four or five trials before they start testing a theory by looking for whether or not counters to the theory they've come up with are also true, like we see in the bottom two examples here. And it's important to note that this is not necessarily an effect that's just highlighted in these simple activities. What we tend to see in lots of scientific endeavors and lots of attempts for people to test their own theories about random things around the world is that most of us have a tendency to do exactly what we saw in the activity and commit something that we in cognitive psychology call the confirmation bias where our attempts to prove something is true is usually just filled with attempts to show things that support ideas true, not that ideas that refute our, our concepts are false. And this is actually something that students in lots of our statistics and research methods classes are constantly pushed to think about when setting up designs and studies and, and finding ways to really prove some of the theories they come up with have merit to them. And if we're looking for why this confirmational bias is so strong, a concept that's often tied to it is this idea of something called functional fixedness. Our mind's tendency, once we found a path or a way to solve something, to become rigid and really struggle to understand other ways and approaches that could be utilized to try to tackle a problem. And this isn't always something that leads us to fictitious thinking, but it's important to note here that it can lead us to being sort of blind to alternative options and alternative ideas to some of the solutions that might be out there 
for some of the problems that we encounter. And this brings us to a really important juncture when talking about problem solving. How do we get better at this stuff? It's probably more important to not only be aware of some of the ways that we can go wrong, but also to understand some of the ways that we can learn to do things more effectively. And I sort of alluded to one really critical aspect to avoiding some of these pitfalls in the last slide. Many times when people start to study specific areas, they come into those areas with a lot of the heuristics and problem solving issues that we've talked about. And as they develop within those areas, maybe as a psychology major or as a researcher or as a graduate student, one of the things that they're constantly pushed to do is reassess the way they approach the problems that they're encountering. Over time, through multiple experiences and lots of situations where your heuristics don't always work, people become closer and closer into becoming what we define as experts in an area. And what this allows individuals to do is avoid some of the more problematic heuristics that are a part of the area that they're interested in. But it also allows them, when they are using heuristics, to tap into ones that can get them to faster answers, but also answers that are better. So people who become, say, experts in driving because they've become cab drivers in a certain area and they learn the ins and outs of places, you know, become better at not only kind of coming up with solutions to problems, but they get faster at coming up to those solutions and start to do them almost implicitly without even realizing that they're problem solving in those situations. It also allows people to recognize the nuances to the problems and questions that they encounter as they become more and more versed in whatever it is that they're becoming trained in. It's really important to note that expertise in numerous studies has proven to be something that has to be not just a byproduct of really learning something, but through lots and lots of repetition, lots of experience that requires oftentimes people to make errors and to learn how to navigate in places and what happens if you don't do things uh, as you kind of progress in the field or progress in the area that you're interested in. Uh, and it's also important to note that as we become an expert in one area, we might be linked to other areas of interest. But there's lots of research to suggest that going beyond what our scope of understanding is, it can be problematic. Uh, and this links up to actually other cognitive issues like the overconfidence barrier and other things that we don't have much time to talk about in this problem solving class, but I want you to recognize are key critical elements to, to kind of the challenges that people encounter when they're trying to solve new problems that maybe do relate to some of the things that they become more versed in or if we could even say experts in. So if we're looking for kind of a take home point here, obviously being aware of some of the problems we encounter is, is a good first step in problem solving research. Having an understanding of some of the techniques we use to solve those problems is also a really important well, second step in understanding how to become a problem, better problem solver. And hopefully now that we've covered some of the follies and issues that come up and some of the things that can help you overcome those problems, you can not only understand this idea of problem solving a little bit better, but you can apply a lot of the stuff that we've been discussing here to your own life. And it eventually will allow you to at least become a better problem solver in your one area when you become an expert in it. And it'll encourage you to keep in mind that you don't necessarily, when you become an expert in one area, get to be an expert in all areas where you tend to be just described at that point, not as an expert, but a know-it-all. Uh, it's a very interesting topic. I encourage you to read more about this in the text. And if you have any more questions, I encourage you to ask, but I think this is probably a good point to kind of close things out here. Now, there's potentially some other cognitive topics that we're gonna be talking about in the future when we get into developments in other areas. But uh, this pretty much marks the end of a lot of the, the cognitive areas that we're going to be talking about. So please 
make sure you've been keeping up with things, you've been taking copious notes, and uh, hopefully we'll be seeing most of you very soon. Take care all.